Welcome to the Spoken Tome Media podcast series. You need to hear this. In this edition, Mark Jeftovic speaks with Charles Hugh Smith. Hi, everyone. Mark Jeftovic here, Spoken Tome Media. I'm here with Charles Hugh Smith. Charles wrote the first couple of books that Spoken Tome ever released as audiobook. That was uh, A Radically Beneficial World and Why Our Status Quo Has Failed. Since then, we've done three more titles. We've released Inequality and the Collapse of Privilege. We just put the finishing touches on Money and Work Unchained, so you should be able to see that in about a week or so. And Charles' latest book, Pathfinding Our Destiny, we had out on audio just before Christmas. So, Charles, it's great to have you back. Thank you, Mark. It's my pleasure to discuss my work with you. Great. I mean, the last time we talked was before before 2016 was the last time we, we did a podcast show. And since then, I remember uh, you came up in the news um, – as part of like something that I just found was just ridiculous and cartoonish and egregious. And that was the whole Russia gate uh, narrative in the mainstream media. When this shadowy organization that nobody really knows who it was at the time, anyhow called proper not released an unvetted unsourced unattributed list of so-called Russian uh, propaganda outlets. It included Zero Hedge. I know Zero Hedge picks up a lot of your work and some of my work, and it included your website of Two Minds. And um, what did you think of that? Yeah, it was a source of, of amusement once I got over the shock of being um, Putin's handyman, and, and I hadn't even received any payment from, from Putin. So it was really <laughs> annoying, right? I mean, if I'd been paid a couple of hundred thousand dollars, it would have been okay. But um, so, yeah, it, it was astonishing uh, on several levels. And I think the most important level was, as, as you just uh, uh, mentioned, that the mainstream media swallowed this whole with no critical analysis or investigative reporting. And that was the tell that we've entered a new era that, um, it, that really is uh, propaganda has um, become the the main um, dynamic of the mainstream corporate media. And I would include state media like PBS in the U.S. and, um, you know, uh, the equivalent in other, you know, uh, France Cat 20, you know, France 24, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, throwing in the state media uh, with the corporate media, that that, that whole uh, mechanism for, uh, distributing so-called news and narratives is now in thrall to a very centralized and very distorted uh, mechanism. Yeah, is it ever? I mean, I'm just noticing, it, it, well, not noticing, I just, I, I ruminate a lot that this is mainstream media is more about narrative than it is about actual news. Let's talk about populism a bit. Um, you know, I, I hear speaking of, of mainstream news narratives, populism is like, um, a swear word these days. And I looked up the word in the dictionary the other day and it said concern for the average citizen or, um, person. And I wonder why it's being held out within the mainstream media, that same mainstream media as the worst thing since, uh, Nazism. Right. It's, it's interesting you bring that up, uh, Mark, because I think we're, we're certainly in a global surge of, of um, populism, which I, I think you, know, you and I would, would see as a pushback against uh, globalization, centralization, and the erosion of democracy, which uh, globalism uh, represents, right? In other words, once once uh, nation states have been subsumed by into empires or or um, equivalent of the European Union, then the the average citizen has no representation left, really. Right? I mean, they really don't have, have any political power. They are politically invisible, 
And I think that um, a lot of the commentators in France that um, they are pointing out that the yellow vests uh, movement is, is really um, an attempt by those who are invisible to say, hey, we're still here. <laughs> we still count, you know. And um, in a lot of nation states, um, the disenfranchised, like the yellow vests, are the actual majority. And so, therefore, that's why won and why Trump won, despite losing the popular vote. A tremendous number of people feel disenfranchised politically and economically in the, in the current status quo. And, of course, this also explains why the status quo has to pursue this um, intense propaganda uh, campaign to uh, reassure everybody that the, the, the status quo narratives are still valid, they're still holding, and um, any, any dissent or skepticism toward these is, is um, as you say, leading toward uh, Nazism. And, and that's, that's just such an absurd uh, point of view, right? But that's where, we're, that's where we've uh, come, is that now if you are skeptical or uh, dissenting, then um, you are a populist on, on the road to um, supporting Hitler. <laughs> and there's no, there's no, there's no it's, it's all or nothing. And, and right there, we can see that the system feels um, that those in must be extremely afraid of losing control of the narrative if they have to go to that, that, that level of, of propaganda where it's all or nothing. You're either uh, with us or you're, you're the enemy. Right, right. And, and where I see a lot of this leading is this sort of unspoken um, prodding toward uh, I mean, they say, of course, this is to defend our democracy, but it's it's nothing of the sort because, as you say, when 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 the the popular uh, vote goes the wrong way, it's not supposed to count. Oh, we need a do over. We can't we can't have this. And it go and it's I see it going towards you know like a technocracy, which is a word you don't hear the mainstream media use a lot, but it is a good description for the European Union and uh, and you know, some of the thought leaders of today are coming out and saying, yeah, this is sort of how we, you know, democracy is getting messy and maybe we need more of like an expertly managed uh, government structure. Right. And I think that's a very good description of what uh, is we call sort of globalism in the sense that um, this narrative is of tech technocracy suggests that we should all uh, let go of our um, na national uh, nation state identities and loyalties and become uh, free floating uh, citizens of the world with open borders and no national identity. And of course, then we, then we have to ask, well, how do we vote in that structure? Where do we have any political power? And of course the answer is you don't vote and you don't have any political power. You know, your, your one vote was, you approved of this global structure and um, that that's it. That's the only vote we need. <laughs> right. And yeah. so that, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, I call, I call most of these elections are like largely ceremonial ratifications of not very different policy tracks. And so I think when you get the populist label is when someone, when, when a vote goes outside of those lines. Right, right, exactly. The approved vote. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've, I've been looking for this for a long time and I just can't find it, but there is this old Wizard of Id cartoon. Do you remember Wizard of Id? Yes. It, yeah. So they take, do you remember like that creature they had in the dungeon? It was just covered in hair. It was like the guy in the dungeon. <laughs> they bring him yeah. out. Yes. They bring, yeah. They, they bring him out of the cell one day. The guard brings him out of the cell and he's like, what's going on? He goes, it's time to vote. He's like, we vote. Oh yeah. And they put him in a voting booth and there's two levers and one says King and the other says other guy. So he pulls the other guy lever and a trap door opens underneath him and he lands back in his cell. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I, I, I wish I could find that. I've like looked in my, my old, bookshelves and stuff and I just can't find it but one of these days but so where where do you think the whole you know a phrase we're hearing a lot lately is uh, democratic socialism is that a populist movement is it a populist brand or is it like I mean where does it, even I think even the entrenched um, elites or the entrenched establishment on the dem side 
don't like the democratic socialists. Right. So let's, um, let's put some context around this. And, um, and I think it ties into what we've been talking about is people, the, the, the bottom say 95%, or if you want to stretch it a bit, say the bottom 80% of, of the populace in, in Western uh, economies recognize they're losing ground, right? They're losing ground economically, socially, they, they're losing um, their sense of security and identity, and politically they've been uh, basically ignored and disenfranchised. And so they, they, want, um, they, they want a solution, they want to fix this problem, right? And so um, one attractive philosophy is uh, socialism, which of course covers a lot of different, uh, a lot of ground, but, but the basic idea of socialism as it was originally conceived in the 19th century was ownership of, by the state, which is supposed to be democratically run, so that a democratically run state that owns the, the means of production would then distribute that, uh, the, the goods and, and services created by that uh, state-owned um, industry more broadly um, than, than capitalism would, which of course capitalism is the idea that um, addressing scarcities creates value and profits, which then flow to the people who um, own the assets that are, are filling the scarcities, right? I mean, that's kind of my quick summary of what capitalism is. And so um, we understand why socialism, um, democratic socialism is attractive uh, as a philosophy. Now, whether it, it functions or whether people are, are actually talking about the same classic socialism or if they're really just talking about redistribution, and that's where we have to really um, get back to defining what socialism is. And, and a lot of uh, commentators uh, are now kind of saying, well, they're not really talking about classic socialism, which is state ownership. They're talking about redistribution of, of the wealth and income. Um, and that's really uh, not socialism per se. So we can, but, but, but I think the impetus is we want a solution. We realize this system's broken and we want, um, we want a, a fair share. and We want our political uh, voice back. And so we understand the motivation, but whether that will actually do the job and uh, is, um, is questionable. And the basis of that question in my mind is centralization itself has failed. And so democratic socialism is actually um, pursuing that same failed model of let's centralize power and control and of the economy even more, and then we're going to have a solution. But that's the wrong path because once you centralize power and wealth, or control of wealth, then it makes it extremely easy for a, for an elite to grab control of that centralized power, and that's what we that's the flaw in the system we live in right now. You know, there's a couple of things in what you just said that that um, that that struck me, and uh, so one of them is the when you described what you know classically defined socialism is versus what what socialism as it's described today would be and how very different they are. It, 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 every appealing looking label gets co-opted by the people who are in power to actually, it, it's a complete bastardization of what it means. What we call capitalism today is, is anything but even Keynesianism. I think Keynes would probably be rolling in his grave if he saw what was going on because, you know, at the essence of Keynesian monetary theory, he said, run deficits during hard times so that you can pay them down using surpluses in the, in the good times. And that has never happened since. So, but then the other side of what you were saying was, let's try more of what's not working to fix things. <laughs> right? So even we, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're in, we're in a, we're in, we're, we're in a Keynesian trap now in that, you know, the fed can't normalize interest rates without the markets freaking out. And you and I, I mean, we were talking about uh, modern monetary theory via email over the past couple of days, how that's even like the next step beyond Keynesianism with it. We're like, okay, we're, we're overwhelmed in debt. We're trapped with, with at, 
with artificially low interest rates. How are we going to fix this? Let's just remove any constraints altogether and just have as much money as we want and as much debt as we want, monetize it all, and that's going to fix everything. And so we've now, sorry, go on. You're about to say something. No, no. I was simply going to add uh, that uh, along with this whole idea of, mo of the monetary theory that let's just take away all constraints is universal basic income. In other words, if we were going to track on, on Google the, the trending solutions to the, the, the broken system we inhabit, it would be you know, democratic socialism, a modern monetary theory, and universal basic income. In other words, let's just create money out of thin air and give everybody a thousand or two a month. And that will solve all of our problems, tying back into your Keynesianism, which is if we create enough aggregate demand, which is, uh, you know, the Keynesian term for everybody wants more of everything. And um, right. then, then, we're, then, then we've solved our problems problems, right? But they haven't changed anything that's actually broken in the structure. They haven't changed the fact we live on a finite planet with, with, without unlimited resources. So you can, you can create unlimited money, but you can't uncreate unlimited resources, right? And then it's, it's totally centralized. And um, so that all this, all this aggregate demand uh, that they're going to create with free money, uh, all the wealth is still flowing to the top one-tenth of 100% who own the assets that are creating all this. So it's like the system's still broken. They haven't fixed anything. So that's, that in itself is remarkable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, a brief side note on what you're saying about, um, because I know you think a lot about automation and how, like, I think, I think you and I both think there's going to be a lot less jobs in the future. And the solution to that is universal basic income. But the other thing, don't forget, modern monetary theory has a jobs guarantee in it. So you've got the universal income and a guaranteed job against a backdrop of artificial intelligence and automation and a job again coming down the pipe. Right. And, and that, that would be the one element um, of that I think would be useful to explore as a guaranteed job. But again, I go back to the, the core of my, my uh, latest book, but it's, it's also been in my previous books, which is, why is the system broken on a system basis, right? And, and you, you're a systems guy, right? Because you, uh, you uh, actually understand how the internet functions as a system. And it's a, it's a network. And um, basically, I, I'm proposing that if you have a strictly hierarchical system, which is a centralized government, centralized corporate power, um, and so on, then your system's already broken because it's very brittle. It's, it's not adaptable, it's not flexible. And um, so therefore it's very prone to fail in nonlinear change. In other words, when, when in change is very incremental and very slow and very predictable, then these kinds of hierarchical um, systems which have all the power and all the wealth concentrated at the top of the pyramid, they work okay because you can just, you can modify policy with little tweaks and everything's fine. But when you have breaks in in the system when you have nonlinear change like geometric change as opposed to linear then these kinds of brittle systems fail and and they they fail because they they've lost their flexibility they're no longer resilient um they're no longer flexible and they no longer have the capacity to adapt to change all they know how to do is do more of what's failed and so um, modern monetary theory is just doing more of what's failed. And so the, the guaranteed job, well, where's that job going to, um, who's going to, who's going to control that? And of course they don't say who's going to control it, but we know that there it's the, it's the top of the pyramid, right? It's the, it's the top of the hierarchy. It's going to be the equivalent of the 1930s where the, the central state d decides who gets hired and what job they do. So if they, if we want to, follow Keynesian's um, famous example of have a million people dig a hole and then fill it, um, that'll, be, that'll be fine. And to me, that's anathema because what we really need is instead of a hierarchy, we, we, we need a highly networked system of individual nodes it, that, that I call the community economy. In other words, the jobs should be created and addressed in each community. And, and so that's already different because... Um, the, the central government run by a few bureaucrats at the top uh, serving corporate interests, they don't know what, the, what each community needs. They, they have no idea. And, and the structure itself 
is incapable of knowing that kind of information, right? And so um, I think we're coming to a fork in the road where all those centralized models, whether they are the neo-feudal model that, that, uh, that I discuss or, or uh, this um, guaranteed work through M MMT and, and universal basic income, democratic socialism, that's just another slightly different flavor of the same failed system. Right, right. Let's talk a bit about pathfinding our destiny because the, this is where you really bring a lot of the themes that we've covered today and in your previous work together. I mean, you talk about, you know, the, 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 the fissures appearing in the current system and what's wrong with it. And then you spend, you know, at the end of the back half of the book is finding the way forward. Right. Right. Um, and so I think that the, um, the key element that I'm trying to get people to think about is, um, you know, we know about evolution and, um, and uh, natural selection and that this is the way that nature works, but it's also the way that human social and economic systems work, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, technology um, is often changes things and then we have to adapt. And if we don't adapt, then we, we die. We we go bankrupt or we fade away, right? And so um, we can, if you look at history in an, as an evolutionary process, then you can see that, um, that, that as change speeds up, right? So-called future shock, then yeah. the systems, the social systems, the institutions th that survive, um, they have to adapt. And, um, and, and so what we're really looking for is we're looking for, systems and institutions that have the means to adapt quickly and rapidly and that those systems that don't have lost that or it's been it's been buried because everybody wants to keep it exactly as it is because I'm need to lock in my benefits right so I don't want any change that system is doomed and so you know in in, in the um in the tech world and in the private sector, you know, we all know examples of, of, of very, uh, very successful corporations that went to a, uh, that were forced into making rapid change and they, they faced either oblivion or uh, um, they had to adapt and, and grow. And so like say Intel had to choose between memory chips and processors, right? And it was a do or die decision. You can't do both. And when Steve Jobs stepped back into Apple in 1997, it was like, the, the, this highly successful company had um, become brittle and lost its resiliency. And it was um, uh, uh, like 60 days from bankruptcy. <laughs> right. So those are examples. And, and, and of that, that's from the private sector, but entire com uh, corporations, not just corporations, but entire nations go through the same process. And so, um, you know, Venezuela, there's a lot of discussion here that the U.S. is the bad guy. Uh, as usual, and it's all it's all the U.S.'s fault. But actually, um, I think uh, I have some correspondence in Venezuela, and it's very clear that the Venezuela's problems are largely self-inflicted. And so, it's a failed state, it's a failed economy, and it's failed its citizens for um, a lot of reasons. And they all go back to what I'm talking about, which is extreme centralization, loss of adaptability, um, not an actual network. It's more like just a rigid hierarchy and, and so on. So these are, these are the system traits that I want us to focus on because the only way that we're going to have a, a future destiny is if we embrace um, evolution and say we're going we're gonna to retain those characteristics that allow us to adapt quickly as change speeds up and becomes chaotic. Right, right. And one of the things that you talked about, which I think a lot – of the, the narrative today fails to see this, or at least the policymakers do, is that when a business is facing these changes, it's adapt or die, right? And uh, that's as it should be. But when a government faces the same kind of existential threat of like a complete policy failure, it is, it is an adapt or die. Everything else has to adapt to the policy because you can't have, you can't, take the consequences of being wrong. I mean, I, I wrote a blog post a long time ago. I ended up calling it, 
you know, we're living in this state of Keynesian bliss, which was a concept that Keynes had about eventually we would arrive at this equilibrium state where everything would be great. But I originally was calling that the extinction of consequences, which is like, well, we can't have, we can't let the excesses ring out of the system. We have to keep it going. Like yesterday, Jim Cramer saying there should be an investigation, an SEC investigation into why the stock market tanked on Christmas Eve. Right. Uh, and, and because the stock market can only go up, the system can only go in one direction and it can't stare at the consequence of a policy failure. And someone who talked a lot about that, that nobody's ever heard of was a guy named Vincent Lacasio who wrote, maybe you have, he wrote a couple of books about, you know, the special privileges of bankers and golds, the discipline that a gold standard imposes. And then, um, Ferdinand Lipp's Gold Wars obviously talks about how getting off of that gold standard before World War I was what enabled World War I to continue for four years instead of six months. Because if, 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 if governments had to have adapted in the same way that a business or a household would have had to have adapt to changing reality, they wouldn't have been able to sustain the war. And then, you know, he lays out the case that that led to World War II and then everything ever since. So, um, well, you know, Mark, that's a fascinating uh, example of what we're talking about. And I'm glad you brought that up is that um, what, what we're really saying is nature, um, you know, when we look at an ecosystem and how it evolves or, or, or dies, if it doesn't adapt or species, then um, we're, we're highly attuned to the idea that they, that they, individual animals, you know, organisms and species can't evade the consequences of the, of the change, right? In other words, their, their environment is changing, and so they, they have to adapt, or they have to move out of that environment into another one. And yet, as you say, our in, the entire history of the last, say, 30 years has been one in which um, those in charge of, of our political and, and economic systems have evaded the consequence by just borrowing more money from the future and consolidating even more power into the top of their of their hierarchy. And so um, one of the concepts I often refer to is um, the S curve, which is, uh, uh, again, it's drawn from evolutionary theory that when, uh, when, we, uh, when we track things like the spread of a disease or the advance of a species, there's often a boost phase um, where um, this successful adaptation just takes off, right? And it's like, or it's, it, another example is the, uh, the adoption rate of the internet, right? That it goes from a handful of early adopters and then suddenly there's this boost phase of explosive growth of users of the internet. And then, it, then there's a maturity phase where the growth rate slows down and, and, and um, in a lot of systems, then there's a decline phase where um, the maturity phase, it just sort of burns through um, all the uh, all the benefits that were accrued from whatever adaption took place, and now the consequences start coming due, and then you get a fall off or even a collapse. Um, and so that's kind of where I feel we're at. We're, we're we're at the we're through the maturity phase of financialization, if you will, and centralization, and now the consequences are coming due, and so the system is scrambling to evade those, as you say. Um, that's that's the name of the game is evade the consequences by pushing them forward into the future by borrowing ever more money from the future right and so you know do you do you think that this i mean i hate predicting and you probably do too i mean what what do you what do you look at when you consider that this is probably you know, into the mature phase as a fall off scenario or a collapse scenario? Are we talking like John Michael Greer to long descent or are we talking like Mad Max? <laughs> yeah, well, um, it, it uh, I mean, in a way, Venezuela shows us sadly that you can get to the Mad Max stage if you, if you refuse to adapt or, or allow um, your citizenry any say in, in the governance, right? You can force uh, a Mad Max situation um, if, if, if you keep doing more of what's failed, right? But I think that the, the, the decline phase will, will play out um, more like there's just less of everything. Mm -hmm. And um, 
because uh, again, there's, there's resource constraints and um, a lot of people have this, as you say, the technocracy, uh, we, we have this sort of religious faith in, in technology. And so when, when people go, well, we're just going to all have free electricity because solar power is going to be free. And, and then there's going to be batteries. And, and then it's all like, well, wait a minute, let's actually look at that. And if we dig into the details of how it's all going to be saved um, by, you know, centralized systems that are going to build out all this, um, you know, free electricity and so on. And um, it turns out that there's a lot of problems with that, right? Like lithium is the source of most of the, the high density batteries and there's actually a limit on lithium. It's actually pretty expensive. And um, uh, there's just one example of many, right? And so I think the, the, what I see is I see the, the, the human systems, uh, the, the, the social, economic and political control systems are all increasingly brittle They've lost their resilience. They, um, they are no longer adaptable because those in charge have, uh, will focus all their energy on keeping the system as it is, even as it fails. And so, um, and, and, and the U.S. in particular is filled with examples like this, like the healthcare system is going to bankrupt the nation. Um, you know, higher education, all they've done is just borrow, you know, trillions from the future to hold up. A, a, a rotten to the core, ineffective, inefficient, um, bloated system, right? And so those systems are going to break down and they're going to break down in either because they're going to debauch the currency, right? They're going to keep printing money until they destroy the currency or they're going to um, break down for social and political reasons because of rising inequality, which is what, and, and we're seeing like the yellow vests and Brexit. Um, those are examples of, of responses to, um, rising inequality and the failure of systems like, you know, education and healthcare, that systems that are highly centralized and, and they're not really adapting as they should or as we would, as they need to. So these systems are going to break down. And so it'll, it'll, it'll come about in a lot of different ways, depending on which country you're in. Um, and uh, well, we, you know, we see, but we see the breakdown happening. We saw a good, you know, uh, maybe a microcosm of this right now with the, we'll call it the partial government shutdown in the U.S. I mean, today I saw the news item. It, it first came across the wires as flights to LaGuardia halted because they had a manpower shortage in the air traffic controllers. And then as the details emerged, it was, well, no, it's not a halt of fl flights. We're just underpowered. So we're, we're on, we're reducing our throughput, but the quote, in one of the newspaper articles was about, you know, all my guys are stressed out. They're trying to figure out how they can consolidate their credit cards at zero interest because they're not getting paid. And this is 31 days. This is like two paychecks and it's starting to grind, you know, air traffic into New York down. And there's a thread on one of the, the libertarian groups I'm on where they're just sort of comparing these anecdotes of just total government waste you know, people said, yeah, you know, I worked as a sysadmin for this government, you know, division over here. And then he would describe the whole process of like how to get anything done. And the worst crime that he could commit, he committed, he wrote a bunch of scripts that basically automated like what these guys were doing all day long. <laughs> and it's like, you can't do that because that's how we get paid. But, um, you know, so it was just, it was just shows that how, how so much of it is just built on institutionalized lethargy, you know, and, uh, and you take away the punch bowl for two paychecks and the whole thing falls apart. I love your term institutionalized lethargy. Um, <laughs> yeah. And let's, let's, I, let's talk real quickly about uh, two other concepts in the book, which are optimization and the loss of buffers. And that's exactly how I would describe what you, this, um, this example is if you, if you can't live for longer than uh, 30 days without a paycheck, meaning you've got no savings, you've got no buffers, right? And so um, once your buffers are thinned to that level, then the system is really prone to collapse. And, and I think that we all know lots of examples. The more you know about an industry, the more you know how thin the buffers are on the delivery of, <clears throat> of medications that have to be refrigerated, on the delivery of, of petrol, you know, gasoline. There's, everything is now 
now uh, extremely, um, you know, uh, vulnerable uh, because it's all been optimized for cheap energy, abundant energy, um, just you know, in time uh, delivery. Uh, yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. All down the chain. And so um, we have very little buffers, uh, very few buffers systemically. And we also don't have, um, it's all been optimized. And so you can't change the optimization overnight. And that's basically like, as you say this, in this example, once you, once somebody automates something, um, there's no buffer. Uh, there's no, you can't change the optimization of that system without, without disrupting the entire system. And so those of us in private enterprise, um, we're used to, to uh, we're accustomed to being dealt with rapid change that, that we have to make um, huge changes in our business or actually change the, the nature of our business or move into another business to survive. It's, you know, that's just normal life to us. But within these institutions that run 90% of our economy, that, that's like an athlete. They, they've they've completely lost that, um, that kind of adaptability, and that's that's one of my major points. And so, to, to to get beyond this, like how do we how do we have a better future? How do we pathfind a better destiny or a survivable or, or, or um, sustainable destiny? Well, we're going to have to move away from hierarchy and this optimization for just in time um, zero buffer kind of reality to um, kind of like a, a, a highly networked. Um, system of of equals and this is like where those of us like you and i we we're used to this system already where we hire other people to do specific things for us and um, they have their own business they're not dependent on us and so our um our connectedness is um is transparent if you will like we're not um, we're not dependent on each other solely like a government contractor is dependent on a government contractor or a person getting universal basic income is totally dependent on the central state. And so, you know, um, I don't need to describe to you the effectiveness of a network structure in terms of adaptability and, and, and effective use of resources. And you could probably do a better job than I can about describing how a network is so much more effective and adaptable than a hierarchy. Right. Right. Um, although I'm kind of in a weird space in the technology space because I'm in the, the DNS and domain name business and it's an inverted tree hierarchy that runs the whole show. So, um, but, but, you know, point taken, I, you know, because as, as an internet guy, I do, I do understand that. And then actually I always used to say whenever at the risk of sounding too constrained to my specialty, but whenever, ICANN, which is the body that oversees the namespace, whenever they did something egregious and people would freak out and say, we need a P2P DNS model, I would always like throw cold water on it and say, you can't do P2P DNS because you can't have name collisions, end of story, we're stuck with this hierarchy, until Bitcoin came along. You know, and suddenly there's this blockchain idea and you had um, initiatives like Namecoin and Ethereum name service late, later and, um, and now there's many, there's a plethora of them and, it's, and I, I have eaten those words since and said, oh, I guess you can do P2P DNS if you use a decentralized blockchain for your, your naming route. So, you know, when I, when I look at, you know, the part in Pathfinding, like part seven, where, where we're talking about what the way forward looks like that it's outside of the control of the of the establishment that it's outside of the system i get this sense that for 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 you know society to flourish and sort of adapt around around this and evolve i guess that's the key word we're going to do this around the institutionalized hierarchies there's not going to be a uh, they're not going to get religion one day. We're not going to elect the right candidate. We're not going to have the right party gain power in air quotes. That's suddenly going to say, I read this great book by Charles Hugh Smith, and this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> right? It's just, it's going to be something like it's, right. the institutionalized hierarchies will just lose more and more re relevance as these new social and business and financial configurations just start gaining more and more relevance. That's an excellent point, Mark. And I think um, if anything, I didn't emphasize that enough that, that really what we're talking about 
is kind of like hacking the system in the, in the old time sense of a hack was a, a, a workaround. It wasn't mm -hmm. like you were breaking into the system to steal something. You were just kind of, you'd created a workaround for like a kludgy system that just didn't work. <laughs> and so, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be working around this and, and, um, Bitcoin, um, is, is one example of how workarounds are, are manifesting. And of course the status quo is going to try to suppress those and, or co-opt them. But it, what we're really talking about is when systems fail at a systemic level, you can't, you know, you can't reform those. You're not going to make a policy tweak that's going to fix higher education or, or the healthcare system. It just isn't going to work, you know. And so people are going to start working around that and they're going to be starting to pay cash for, for medical care from um, pop-up providers, right? Or, you know, yeah. uh, remote, remote uh, physicians or, you know, there's lots of different solutions to that. And in education, I think we're, what I see the model that's going to emerge, whether people like it or not, and um, is that students are going to start taking control of their own education and they're going to start organizing their own education. They don't need this bloated structure that charges them $70,000 a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, um, and that's, that's where technology, the internet and, and networking has really it's enabled a whole suite of solutions that basically do bypass all the institutions that are now that hold the wealth and power and it, that um, have all this, uh, as you say, institutionalized lethargy as, 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 um, as their, their model. And so it's actually quite an exciting time. And for those who are dependent on the system within these institutions, it's a very disturbing time because of course, you're looking at your livelihood and career and going, gosh, I was counting on this to stay exactly as it is for the next 30 years. Well, that's not going to happen. You know, that the fourth industrial revolution is going um, is going to dis uh, disrupt virtually every element of our society because it, um, it's, it's the only way that evolution works, right? You can resist it and borrow from the future, but those are just stopgap measures. You haven't really um, changed anything to make it sustainable. And so that's really what we're talking about is why don't we embrace, um, why don't we embrace change, embrace um, adaptation and, um, and, and build a better, fairer, more sustainable um, society and economy rather than cling on to these failed models and then, um, and then to just lead to a very painful collapse. Indeed. Why don't we? Um, <laughs> this, could be, this could be a good place to, uh, why don't you tell us, you know, tell, the, tell the, the folks where to find your website and if you have another book in the works and, and uh, we'll leave it there. Okay. Um, yeah. Visit me at of2minds.com. You can download uh, free uh, chapters of Money and Work Unchained and Pathfinding and Our Destiny and um, take a look at the book um, and, and uh, get a good idea of what, what you've got there if you want to go ahead and buy it or buy the audio book. Um, if you're an Amazon Prime member, um, then you, you, get a free, um, you get a free audio book as part of your membership. So that's an opportunity right there. Um, so please check it out. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my work, Mark. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Charles. It's always great talking to you.